James is hilarious. He's an inspiration for the city. Really, really excited to see a show. I think it's pretty scrappy and also takes a lot of inspiration to realize a place that other people see as downtrodden is actually being a wealth of opportunity. That really resonates with people that they want something positive to believe in too, so he's kind of leading the way. It feels like, it feels almost like my whole life has been building up to this moment uh, in many ways. Which makes me think of something Jerry Seinfeld said to me about playing these rooms. He said, the thing with comedy is it doesn't matter how deep the water is, all you can do is swim. And what I've got to do right now is just go out there and swim and hopefully not sink. Doesn't matter what happens tomorrow, this is it. This is it. I'm very proud to call him a true friend. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. James! When I first moved to St. John and I would meet people from here, the first thing they would always say to me was, why? Why would you leave London, England for here? And I'd say, do you not see what I'm seeing? Look around. Look at the amazing architecture, the beautiful views, the friendly people, the amazing nightlife. I was astounded to discover that St. John doesn't have the best reputation. People think it's foggy here, that it's a stinky industrial town where nothing happens and there's high unemployment. And the big surprise, really, for me, was to discover that people from here don't even love their own city. But let's be honest, there are a lot of very weird and wonderful things here. <laughs> things that make it very easy for a comedian to write material. To be honest, it's actually quite hard for comedians to come up with new material. Not in St. John, it's not. I love about gigging in St. John, honestly, right? In London, I'd go out, might be a thousand people there, I'd look out, I wouldn't recognise anyone, right? I'd come out in St. John, I know all of you. <laughs> and as I'm looking out, I can see the guy that sold me my garage door. <laughs> my personal trainer's down there. <laughs> Hi, Sabrina. <laughs> looking heavily pregnant there. <laughs> Don't worry, she is pregnant, by the way. That I did check that in advance. That would have been a terrible start to the show. We should have gone, what do you mean? So this is a memory book my wife bought me about 10 years ago when I first started getting press for my stand-up. And I was just doing you know, small gigs at the time. And I, I made a pact for myself, I would say about 2010, around here when I did my school days tour, when I thought, if I'm not playing arenas by the time I finish this book, then I'm giving up stand-up and getting a proper job. Here we are, and I just have three pages left for my first arena show, Harbour Station, here in St. John. Most people, when they start doing stand-up, generally have a job that they hate. I actually had a job that I loved. I had a day job working for GQ magazine. The next five years were a grind, plowing around the country, on stage almost every night, and then in the morning having to do a fairly high-pressure, high-stress job. Then an opportunity came up at GQ where I was made the comedy editor, which led to umpteenth opportunities to meet my heroes. 
It was my work on the GQ comedy issue that I think led people to think that I could host a TV show. Movie Kingdom was essentially conceived out of the idea that there wasn't a funny film review show. There's no feeling like making a thousand people in a theatre laugh, but when you make George Clooney laugh, that's when you feel like a real man. The director of all of the shows that I was working on then started conceiving a script that was about this lunatic who essentially was doing most people's dream job, which was interviewing comedians and hanging out with comedians, but all he really wanted was to be a full-time stand-up himself. Last year, the film was completed, starring a, an all-star British cast. It's quite a surreal time for me, you know, in that I've gone in the space of five years from being the guy that was dying on his backside and, and struggling to get numbers through doors. To suddenly now, five years later, you know, there's this big budget movie coming out about my life. I was born and raised in St. John. I was 22 years into my career. Loved the time I lived and worked in Toronto, and then I was 15 years in London. We had one little one and knew that the second was coming, and we were ready to make a change in our life. It was one of the first times in my life that I'd kind of put my career slash ego on hold just for one minute, and I'd gone, let's do something for the family. And my happy place has always been here. There's a reason why every summer I wanted to come to St. John on holiday. And we never thought that we would be able to carry on our careers here, but that wasn't why we came here. I came here expecting to give all of this up. He literally just arrived and hit the ground running. So the first run of successful shows I did, actually, funny enough, were in a vineyard. I think what, I mean, the first time I came here, I must admit, well, it took me a while to get here, for starters, because, of course, what you Canadians like to do is mess with English people, don't you? Like, I first met my wife, and she said, you know, come, come to St. John for Christmas and meet my family. I said, lovely. So, of course, I get to the airport just before Christmas. It was the 23rd of December, and I'm phoning her, so I'm here at the airport. She says, where are you? I can't see you. I was at St. John's airport. <laughs> And that was my first realization that, wow, there's something here. And it was that point that I thought about hiring the Imperial Theatre. I, I, I tell you, for those of you who don't know, I, I moved here from London, England a year and a half ago. Um, obviously, uh, I love it here. We moved here for a better quality of life. We moved here because of our kids, but I'm not going to bang on about my kids all night. I know no one wants to hear about other people's kids, especially after back to school day. Back to school day when Facebook's just full of pictures of other people's kids. You're clicking like, but really you're looking for the couldn't give a shit button. <laughs> With everything I've learned living in St. John for the past two years, one phrase I think sums up this city better than any other, and that phrase is, anything is possible. So that will be the title of the show that I take to Harbour Station St. John, the biggest venue in New Brunswick, and my first arena show. And I intend to sell out that arena. I can't do it on my own. But I think what I really need to do is rather than sitting here just internally trying to write this show, what I really need to do is get out and meet some real St. Johnners and find out what ignites the fire in there. I've been told by those in the know that if I want to learn more about the history of St. John, there is no better person to speak to than urban planner and entrepreneur Jodie Clifford. We're meeting at the iconic Backstreet Records that has been spinning vinyl here for over 35 years and pretty much sums up everything I love about living in St. John. When you work in the field I work in, you kind of, you're naturally you're curious about how did things come to be, right? right. There's a lot of critical points in the development of St. John, I think, that are interesting, that show that sort of resilience in the, in the character and nature of the city. Right. The fire in 1877 is a good example. We're in the South End Peninsula right now, which is the most historic part of the country that's still intact in the way it was built originally. So you imagine within, like, let's say, five or six years, an entire city is built right. around you. I mean, that's a massive amount of buildings, right? And after that, I mean, a lot of people lived 
in the southern core part of the city, and it had that critical urban density to have the city sort of thrive. 1950s and 60s, when the automobile took over, I guess people started sprawling a lot further, and we lost sort of some of that density. Once you get people living back in your core, which has happened in the last 10 years here, you can have a lot more of entrepreneurial spirit, a lot more vibrancy, a lot more locally owned shops that are uh, able to survive in that environment. I'd love to hear more about the entrepreneurial spirit in St. John. James, did you mind if I just first like, pick up a record? To... I would not mind at all. That is entrepreneurial spirit <laughs> right there. Nice one. Let's grab some beers. This venue itself has only recently opened. This was uh, built as a car park. Was it really? Yeah, you're, you're sitting in a car stall. Wow. And I'm, I'm feeling beer. good about this car park. <laughs> Normally, when I'm drinking in the car park, I'm hiding in the back seat. You know, I, I, this, is, this is glorious. <laughs> so, I mean, this is an example of like this, I think, resurgence in a community that won't give up. We talked a bit about the Great Five St. John and the way in which the city was rebuilt so quickly, but it does feel to me like there's a, a fire in the belly of St. John right now. But it can't all be perfect. Like, what, what are the challenges that you've faced both as a city planner but also as, as an entrepreneur in St. John? Things aren't necessarily easy here, right? I mean, things are tough. They're tough everywhere. St. John is different in the sense that, like, it's always been a poor city since, like, since the British Army went from wooden ships to metal ships. We've been going through different decades of various levels of poverty. Yeah. So it's been a challenge, and not just for this generation. Like, multi-generational poverty is an issue in this city. Like, that, that can't be something that's not, that's not mentioned as we try to become a better city going forward. We're going to get beat around here, and people are going to point fingers. You're an industrial city. You have this character, that character. But at the end of the day, we're going to decide who we are. I'm British comedian James Mullinger, and I'm just weeks away from putting on the biggest gig of my life in my new hometown of St John, New Brunswick. To warm up for my first ever arena show, I need to test out some brand new material and fine tune my act. The gags are new, so this very well might be a load of bollocks. We're at the St. John Theatre Company, which is a lovely little rehearsal space, which really is the perfect place to test material. It's made very clear that you are coming into, essentially, the, the comedian's mind. A painter doesn't want you to see their painting before they've finished it. Uh, a, a writer definitely doesn't want to show you their, their half-finished novel. We have no choice. No one knows if something's funny until the audience has actually seen it and either laughed or not laughed. I said I moved here from London, England two years ago. Honestly, don't think I'll live anywhere else. And I've become obsessed with learning little facts about St. John. Like really, really interesting facts. Like I don't know if you all know this, that the, uh, that the first paved street in all of Canada was in St. John. The first paved, Prince William Street was the first paved street in all of, of course it hasn't been paved since, but <laughs> it's small victories, right? You've got to enjoy small victories. One of the things that struck me about St. John when I first visited the city was the beautiful architecture. Boasting one of the best collections of Victorian buildings in the whole of Canada, it's kind of like a, a mini London, but without the traffic or bad teeth. And if you're going to talk buildings in St. John, you're bound to run into the husband and wife team of Monica Adair and Steve Cobb from Acre Architects. They've won loads of awards, which you're probably seeing on screen right now. Architecture isn't the only topic this duo can wax about, so I need to know what it takes to be bloody great in this city. How does one find greatness when they're living and basing themselves out of a smaller city? I guess we don't take the conventional order of things as a given, mm. so that's something that we start with. And being on the fringe allows us to operate outside of convention, so in a way you're always 
you're always able to innovate in some way by not coming at it from the same approaches that other people are. But we do try to do projects outside of here as well. That keeps you sharp, keeps you seeing what else is going on and bringing yeah. it back to St. John. What we found here is that it's you're only limited by the potential of how big you can dream. Right. Like at the end of the day, the ideas don't have constraints by geography or by size. So if you can dream big, if you can think big, you can do anything. It's become a cliche when you ask people what they love so much about living here, and often the words friendly people come up. But right. of course, the, you know, which it, it is true, but, it, but of course it's so much broader than that. And it's not, friendly isn't just saying hello on the bus. Absolutely. No. Friendly is the fact that, as you say, right. you go to people and you want to work on something huge. Mm -hmm. They will help. If you ask for help in this area, people are really excited to kind of help you take it to the whatever level you want. Definitely. We're not trying to get to an end or try to get to a goal, but live the life that we want to live. Right. We want to be responsible for any of the limits that we can't pass and then try to work on those. So I think our next step is to put ourselves to the test, to kind of say, like, what kind of risks can we take to create great things in our own life and for the people around us? Another man of words in the port city is Clyde Ray. An expat from New York City, he's been performing his poems and plays for decades all across North America. He's found huge success here as a creative, so I need to find out. Am I making the biggest mistake of my life trying to fill an arena? As a New Yorker, do you ever find the, the closeness intrusive? Is there ever a time? Yes. Yeah. So, I, let's be honest about it. Sometimes you can be walking the street and you want to have a thought and you have to say hello 20 times yeah. before you get to the end of the block. Now, if I, if I happen to be misbehaving outside the three mile, by the time I get home, <laughs> my wife's had 15 text messages. I saw, right. saw James throwing up outside the three mile. That's right. I mean, Whatever dirt I want to do, I better leave down. <laughs> yeah. How do you think the life of an artist differs for you here in St. John to in New York? Like I know I've never really fitted into groups and cliques, so, so coming here for me has been a kind of a spiritual and creative kind of awakening in many ways. And I feel like I've, I've been an outsider in a new place helps me write better material. Oh so yes, and to settle in. And you know, spiritually you have to give yourself to the city in one way or another to become part of the city. Yeah. You know, you have to do something for the city. So it's a give and take process. And if you're doing it uh, altruistically, you will get something back. Maybe not when you want it, but it will come back. Yeah. And I have found that for me, St. John has been exactly that. Very often, I've never had to really ask, except when I'm doing the business mm -hmm. kind of thing, you know, you have to go knock on somebody's door. But things show up. What advice can you give me as someone that, that you know, has ta undertaken probably the, the, one of the biggest and stupidest things I could do? Well, yeah. Don't let people talk you out of what you're doing. Mm. And but, tell you that you're crazy, that you won't make a living at it. I mean, lots of people tried to talk me out of booking an arena to right, do a show. Right. You know, if it's... there is a thing called sin, mm. if there is, right, the sin is not trying. Am I right? Is anything possible here? Or have I gone completely insane? To find out, I need to meet the St. John native Julia Wright, an esteemed journalist who's written for the likes of Vice magazine, Civilized and CBC. She suggests we meet at the city's iconic greasy spoon, Top's Pizza. One of the things that I've seen you write about a lot is the grit and the, the charm of the grit. Can you tell me a bit about that and what you mean by that? You've got this odd sort of mishmash of the grossest sort of manifestations of late capitalism yeah. right beside people's beautiful homes. And I feel that that kind of contrast is something that's really compelling to me. And so it's like spray paint on linen. It's like something that's almost been defaced. I think St. Johners are intensely interested in narratives about themselves because so rarely is St. John or New Brunswick ever represented. And the idea that you have that anything is possible is a noble and worthy one. And people respond to it because there is that hunger for narratives about St. John and narratives of optimism about this place because that's been lacking for so long. 
All I ever really wanted to do was to make a living doing stand-up. All you ever wanted to do was make a living as a writer. We're both now doing that. Arguably, St. John is just getting better. I mean, you look at all of the work uptown, all of the creative things that you're talking about. Here, everything's getting better. And to me, that fills me with optimism. I agree with you that at this moment, St. John is on a bit of an upswing for the creative class. Mm. But I don't think the trajectory is that simple. People that have just been caught up in this generational cycle of poverty that mm. are stuck here, you know, it's anything is not possible for them. We have to tell that story too. Oh, this is how I roll. This is classic English food <laughs> fur. Pizza in one hand, fish and chips on the plate. <laughs> oh what do you love about St. John? I grew up on the east side of St. John. On Friday night, we get to come uptown right. and visit my aunt who lived on Princess Street. And I remember coming over the causeway, and this is so cheesy, and but it's true. I would come over the causeway and see the lights of St. John and feel like it was the sort of place where, I dare say, anything could happen or anything was possible. I have this imagined version of this place that is not the oil refineries, that is not the unpaved streets. It's like this imagined kind of fairy tale St. John that I've held on to my whole life. There is a certain beauty in having to struggle for something, and it's a hard one narrative that St. John excels at. Yeah. We have a lot of people trying really hard to do a lot with very little, and so that's the signature thing about the place, not uh, that idealized vision that I yeah. had. They can coexist. aware that there's possibly too many uh, posters of me around the city. There's two types of people in St. John right now. There's two types of people in St. John. People that have never heard of me and people that are sick to f death of me. <laughs> no one else. That's it. If you want the latest juice in St. John, you better hit the oldest city market in Canada. Locals, tourists, everyone passes through here to get their daily fix of St. John gossip. Let's be honest though, I'm really here to get bums on seats for my big show. So my name's James. I am freaking out about it with just one week left till the gig. Oh, actually, sorry, got a dash. I think there's someone there that might not have seen my face yet. I don't know if you've heard, I'm doing a big show at Harbour Station on Thursday night. Hi, how are you doing? Hey, how are you? Hi, good day. Uh, I'm James. Nice, nice to meet hi, James. You. Yes, I've seen your face before. Yeah. Slocum and Ferris is yours? Absolutely. Wow, and you've been here since 1895. 1895. You look great. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Let's see uh, yeah. all the uh, dulce, all yeah. the seaweed. And uh, for you, what's the best thing about living in St. John? Um, I think it's just the people. Everybody kind of, you know, when I have visitors from out of town, mm. they all wonder if everybody here is either on drugs or we're just insanely friendly. <laughs> but we all seem to know each other, yeah. so they, they want to know what's going on. So. Oh. Would you like to put one of your posters up? You're going to give me a poster? Yeah, how yeah. did you guess that yeah, that was that's why right. I was here? Oh, I, no. I, you, saw me, you, yeah. you saw me coming, so yeah. to speak, I'm, didn't you? Yeah. I don't know if you've heard, I have a show on Thursday night at Harper Station. Yes. It's, uh, you have heard? You've got tickets. You've got tickets? Yeah. Awesome. Yes. Thank, you. Thank you very much oh, indeed. Yeah. Cheers. Bye. Hi guys, how you doing? Sorry to interrupt. Uh, my name's James. Uh, how you doing? Do you find it? Sorry, I didn't mean to flick <laughs> your uh, flick your basket into your genitals there. I apologise. Uh, yeah, you gonna come on Thursday? You legends! Thank you very much. Cheers and enjoy the fruit. And sorry about the genitals. <laughs> I don't know if you know what I do, I'm a, I'm a comedian by trade and uh, I have a big show coming up this Thursday at Harbour Station. Do you mind if I leave you some flyers for the show, is that alright? And, uh, and, and please come, Thursday night, as someone from away, I think you'll appreciate some of the jokes. Because as much as we like it here, the Maritimers do do some weird stuff. When I moved here, when I, I, I picked up the Telegraph Journal, I was really excited to read this news. I came across this and I just thought, this is wonderful. This is a sign of the fact that we live in a safe, wonderful, beautiful community. That this article uh, was published uh, uh, literally about a week ago. St. Stephen hopes to open a pit of pit. <laughs> hopes to. Port City Royal is one of my favourite places to party in St John, and clearly I'm not alone. Its head bartender, Eric Scouton, recently made the top ten list of mixologists in the country. All I know is that he's got me drunk more times than I can possibly remember. Air Canada's En Route magazine named it one of the top new restaurants in Canada, which has got to mean something.
One of the many things I love about Port City Royal is the way that you are using maritime ingredients, but it's kind of got the Jacob spin on it. Sometimes the Jacob way can be a little extravagant and sometimes it can be uh, deathly simple. So we're going to be making a rabbit frico. I'm going to place some rabbit shoulders into the pan. Nice looking shoulders. This looks absolutely delicious. How long do you think it's going to take? Half hour. Perfect. Should we go to the bar and uh, sample some of the other delights? Let's do. Happy days. It's the afternoon, so, uh, you know, in the maritimes, that's time to start drinking. <laughs> Something that I've been playing around with lately is um, a Pim's Cup Martini uh, with Flame Rosemary. All right, here we go, guys. Rabbit Frico. Awesome, thank you. Enjoy. This looks spectacular. Why St. John? Like, you could have opened, um, obviously, in Moncton, Fredericks, and you could have opened in lots of different places. Why St. John? Honestly, it was, it was one evening just walking through uptown uh, from one bar to another. It just had this feel, uh, this large city feel in a small town. It had different pockets. I immediately fell in love. I could walk anywhere I needed to. Uh, without hopping into a cab. You know, at the moment, uh, St. John's experiencing a very large uh, explosion in uh, culture and life. You're going to see a lot more places like this one where the energy is uh, different than what people have grown to expect from St. John, but that embodies the present spirit, attitude, and, and passion that's here in the city. St. John has recently welcomed over 500 Syrian refugees to our community. Leila Rame from Syria was visiting her brother in St. John in 2012 and was unable to return home after the war intensified. Everything she knew changed forever. I feel I remember exactly when I used to walk in the street, I wouldn't look around. I would just look at the the um, uh, sidewalk where I'm, I'm walking and just imagining that I'm back in Damascus. Which is natural given you never got a chance to say goodbye to your um, home. Well, at the beginning, I, I wasn't able to work. Mm. At that point, it was the, the toughest part of the journey because I had no money and, uh, and I, I had to, to find a way to you know, earn my living. So that added to my resentment of staying here. When did the transition take place where you started to kind of uh, feel ensconced within the community? Like I started with like going around the mall looking for a job and then started dealing with people on a daily basis, like seeing the same faces and how to deal with them. And then I realized that they are really nice, like they are friendly and lovable and caring. And I started really building relationships with people. That's when I felt that it's not bad after all. <laughs> and, you know, I might have lost my life back home, but I'm starting a new life here. Yeah. I would lift my head and then now I would look around when I walk in the street. When you look at these views now, d does this feel like home now? Oh, yes. Uh, there were some steps that they just like there were really moments that made me realize that this is going to be home. One moment was when I uh, decided to buy a house. Mm. It was a crazy decision, but I felt I wanted to belong somewhere. Right. I wanted to have something that is like for me on this land. And the second moment was when the Syrian refugees started coming. Right. And I, I looked in the eyes of the people who were welcoming them, people that I've never met in my life mm. before, and people who really were genuine in welcoming them and they wanted to help them settle. And, and I looked around and I said, this is really where I belong now. The place is a place after all. No matter how beautiful it is, if it's like it has seashore or monuments and buildings or whatever is fascinating or old, it's all about the people. I haven't seen any people just like as friendly and genuine and caring like the uh, 
you know, Brunswickers in general and St. Johnners in particular. I've fallen in love with the people, actually. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> You know, they say that the only thing to fear is fear itself. But the people that said that weren't this close to the edge of a rock face that could possibly end my life the night before the biggest gig of my life. When I was at school, teachers used to say to me, uh, the night before a big exam, a very important exam, do, they said, do something relaxing uh, and quiet that you enjoy. And I used to follow that advice, and I failed every single exam I ever took at school. I failed everything. So now, I've taken that advice and I throw it out the window, and the night before an important show, what I like to do is something absolutely terrifying. If I can do this, then surely, walking out on stage in front of four to five thousand people to tell jokes. How bad can that be? The last few weeks I've been, I've been traveling around St. John, I've been meeting people that I, I have, I've never met before, that have great hopes for the city, and uh, they've all taught me a lot. What I'm really proud of right now with, with you know, 24 hours to go is the fact that it's happening. Really all, all I want to achieve tomorrow night is, is I just want to deliver the, the, the greatest show of my life. is finally here. Months and months of planning around the clock, not to mention, you know, 39 years of dreaming about it. Oh, wow. Still can't believe I'm going to be playing the same stage as Jeffrey Seinfeld and Iron Maiden. And uh, I'm going to be up there telling my stupid jokes. Ever need that, right? I should have just six the slides. And then that means basically stay up for the rest of the, the, rest of the night. During the day, I'm a cardiac surgeon, but at night, I get to be a comedian. A little bit more than a year ago, I approached James and I said, hey, I'd love to open for you one night. But I never thought he would take me up on that offer. 20 some odd gigs later, here I am. And I'm getting to open for him. You know, if that isn't a testament to anything that's possible, I don't know what is. So you, you, you've obviously seen the people piling in there. I right? walked down from the hotel. Right. And no, seriously, I'm not messing with you or anything. The par parking lot is full. <laughs> Amelia, how do you feel about the show? <laughs> he's nervous. I think he's more nervous than any of us. Can you believe how many people there are over here? It's unbelievable. The bar will be open before and during the intermission, but it will not be open during the show. So grab your drinks now and get ready in one minute. Thanks very much and enjoy the show. Good thing we got a heart doctor on the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, the incomparable Miss Vicki Payne. I usually talk about sex a lot on stage. <laughs> Why not? You know, we're all here because somebody had intercourse, right? Like, for example, you, sir. It's a mirror. What year were you born? 77, picture it. <laughs> Your mom's bell bottom sat around her ankles. <laughs> Your dad's mullet blowing in the wind. Stella, Stella, you look at me. This is a miracle of you. Thank you, St. John! I like that. 
killed him. <laughs> it's like a comedy Woodstock. Right, right, right. It's like yeah. Good How much can you see from the stage? You can see a lot. So, so um, a lot you here. You can actually see people drinking up in the. Oh really? Yeah. yeah. There's my wife's up there. On a more serious side, New Brunswick needs this kind of vibe yeah, all yeah. the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of like, no, yeah. we're smart enough. Yeah. We can do this. Yeah, yeah. We can make shit happen. Yeah. We can make this place awesome. I mean, you have um, ignited an excitement for comedy in me that I haven't had for years. Oh my God. Thank you so much. So much. People keep saying, oh, are you nervous? And I think the truth of the matter is, I was nervous that this day would never come. Now that it's here, there's really nothing left to be nervous about. All that's really left for me to do is to do a gig, and gigs is what I do. Here's the uh, moment of the evening that we've all been waiting for. They said when he came here that he would never be able to make a living as a comedian in St. John. He's proven them wrong, hasn't he? Yes! He's packed for our station! Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. James Mondra! Dr. Ansar Hassan. What about that? Ansar Hassan, has, as has been mentioned many times, you know, he's a heart surgeon. He's really milking that shit, isn't he? <laughs> well, I've saved hundreds of lives here. <laughs> that is amazing. It's wonderful. He came to me a year ago, just over a year ago. He said, he said James, he said, uh, he said, it's been my dream my entire life to try stand-up comedy. Can you help me? I said, yes, of course I can, of course I can. Because funny enough, it's been my dream my entire life to try heart surgery. <laughs> so if you're booked in for a triple bypass on Monday morning, <laughs> bad luck, I'm doing it. Ridiculousness of this undertaking. We buy tickets for an arena show to see someone in the flesh, no matter how small, in the distance, in the flesh, that we'll never see again, don't we? It's like, oh, well, I'll never see Seinfeld in the flesh again, so I better buy tickets. I'll never see Iron Maiden again in the flesh. Whereas, what's so wonderful about all of you being here is any day of the week you can see this English prick ambling around Sobeys. <laughs> um. I do love it here. It's a beautiful place. I, I had to get used to lots of changes when I first came here, lots of changes. I don't know if you know this, but in England, right, in England, if you went to someone's house for dinner, right, and they said to you, uh, would you like a glass of wine? And you said, oh, I'd love a glass of wine, thanks very much. Do you know what they would do, right? They would leave the room, and they'd come back with a glass of wine. No caveat, no buts. Here in New Brunswick, a whole different beast, isn't it? You go to someone's house for dinner, and they say, would you like a glass of wine? And you say, oh, I'd love a glass of wine. Thanks very much. There's a sentence they will say that will make your heart drop, and that sentence is, I made it myself. <laughs> I do love this city. It's well documented how much I love this city. Now, I will concede, I will admit to you, there is some up shit here. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, I've grown to love the Grand Bay Westfield ferry boat. It's a beautiful thing. To be a, yes, it is wonderful. 
But I, I'll tell you this, every other year that I visited here for the last 15 years, every, every other year I would drive there and arrive at the Grand Bay Westville Ferryboat and there'd be a, a little sign up saying, ferry boat broken. We need to raise another four million dollars for another ferry boat. Four million dollars every year. Do you have any idea how many bloody bridges they could have built? And here's an idea, St. John, right? If they're not going to build the bloody bridge, why don't they just get all the broken ferry boats, put them back to back across the water, we'll drive across the broken ferry boat. By way of a cheer, for example, like this would never happen anywhere else. By way of a cheer, how many people in this room know where I live? <laughs> Terrifying! Sometimes it happens. I was outside the three mile, leaning up against the wall, weeing. I, sh I shit you not, right, before I got home, my wife had had four text messages telling her. <laughs> that should be the new mantra for St. John. Anything goes, everybody knows. I want you to see me walking down the street, and I know I've got a, it's going to take a few years, but I want all of you to see me and say, there he is, there's James, the new Brunswicker. And I'm going to do everything I can within my power to make that happen. I'll be honest with you, St. John, I want to make homemade wine. I'm going to drive a four-wheeler on a highway. The wrong way. I want to wear head-to-toe camouflage just to go to Tim Hortons. I want to think it's perfectly acceptable to pick up women at the Irving Big Star. As an Englishman living in St. John, I want to live in a place that I can finally feel proud of my team. I want to sneak into Costco using my Blockbuster card. I don't want to buy my fish from Sobeys. I want to buy it out of the back of a pickup truck in Sussex. My name's James Mullinger, and I am a New Brunswicker! Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much indeed for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. See you tonight. It was in this spot that I wrote my first ever, ever joke about St. John. It feels beautiful the day after the big show to be back in the place where uh, I kind of observed this ferry boat and thought, oh, that's funny, and wrote something down and tested it for the first time and it got a massive laugh. And I thought, you know what? People from here, I think, like jokes about here. I should keep doing that. I cannot believe that I filled an arena. It's unfathomable to have built a fan base like that. In just two years uh, of living here, I, I honestly cannot uh, believe it. But what I hope is that this isn't an isolated thing. I hope that I carry on doing that. I, I want that experience again. For the rest of my life, a day won't go by without me thinking about that experience. I think for St. John, that show definitely made the audience feel good about where they live. For such a long time, people have been so down on St. John. I really hope that, that people see what's happening here now and realize that there is just so much opportunity. It will come, the burning. It will heat the city of St. John. At first, it will lick at its heels. Then it will become all-consuming. The fire will rise higher. It hasn't yet arrived completely, but it will come. It smolders now slowly. 
but it will come. The fires will burn, passions will ignite. The city will flame and rise above. Then, well after the burning and the fire, the city of St. John will be greatly admired.